All right. What is up, everybody? Welcome into uh, the live today. I am on a high right now because the Kansas City MF and Chiefs just took down the Cleveland Browns in uh, a pretty thrilling finish. Uh, that was that was awesome. Now, I know nobody here is actually like in this chat to hear me talk about the Kansas City Chiefs, but Texas Tech fans, man, if I get some Tech fans rolling up in here, let me let me just extend my uh, my thank you to you once again. I, I do this anytime I speak to the great folks of Lubbock, typically when I'm on with uh, Ryan Hyatt, my man who does radio out in Lubbock. But let me just thank you once again for um, bestowing upon this earth the greatness that is Patrick LeVon Mahomes and uh, making him a Kansas City Chief because it is probably the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my sports life. So uh, once again, look, Cleveland Browns played a perfect game for like three plus quarters. And still the goat took over, man. Got down to goat time, and the goat did what the goat does. And, uh, you know, he was a little bit better than that quarterback from uh, the University of Oklahoma. He was a little bit better than the QB of OU. Uh, UCF fast. I see you in there. Who could be upset with adding UCF? Well, let me tell you, UC fast. I guess that's probably UC fast. That's really uh, – that's really the way I should be spinning it. UC fast. Kansas can be upset with adding UCF. That is who. Uh, Kansas does not seem to be real thrilled with this new Big 12 lineup, and we are going to talk about that today. If you guys have been uh, paying attention to the channel from today, I did post a video with um, Gene Taylor, who is Kansas State's athletic director. He spoke at halftime of the K-State game yesterday, which was also a whirlwind. My goodness. Um but I did ask him about the comments of Travis Goff, uh, Kansas's athletic director. So if you want a, a reaction to that, you can see that. He also had some thoughts on the revenue, where it's going to go revenue-wise for the Big 12 now with the uh, the New Look League. So we can get into all of that. Obviously, you can you can see the comments there, but I definitely have some thoughts to expand upon uh, here in the live show today. So I'm going to do for about 45 minutes or so today. It might be just a tad bit shorter uh, right now based on some plans that I have tonight, but uh, still going to do a pretty good – Pretty good live show here. Yes. Thank you, Philip. Raider Power. Texas Tech fans, thank you so much for uh, Patrick Mahomes once again. So let's just dive right into this. Let's dive right into this. It was a uh, – it was, I, I thought, a pretty good day for the Big 12 on Friday, right? Most most of the schools around the league seem to be pretty happy with how things worked out. And I, I really think and have said, even if you are a school that fancies yourself um, one with better slash different options, like more options – um, you would still look at this and say, like, your our backup plan got better, right? Our backup plan got better. And uh, no matter what, we're in a stronger position today than we were two weeks ago, 50 days ago, et cetera. Uh, 50 days being, like, right after Texas and Oklahoma had announced that they were leaving to the SEC. So I, I – but – now, I understand the context here. Let me let me set this up, and I, you guys are probably tired of hearing me say this, but if you're not – Oh boy, we got a Florida State fan in here, Albert. I am sorry. <laughs> that that was rough. Uh, I'm not even. If you guys saw the ending of Florida State, Jacksonville State, that was, uh, whew, that was that was not fun. For uh, well, it, I guess it was kind of fun for the rest of us to see how that worked out. But getting beat on basically a hail mary uh, to Jacksonville State, that was. I listened to both radio calls. That was so. Please, everybody, just be nice. That that's all I'm saying. Just be nice. Um, be nice to Albert. Because he's hanging out in the chat here, and that was a rough, rough sports weekend. Look, hey, Albert, if it makes you feel any better, uh, K-State, my school, may well have lost its starting quarterback for the rest of the season for a second straight year uh, in the first three games of the year. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it can be a rough, cruel sport. But anyway, Kansas, Travis Goff, the athletic director. So Kansas fans, the whole climate around Kansas right now is that their fan base thinks that they should – and or will be in the Big Ten, if not that, the ACC, that their basketball is too big to fail. That's that's generally been the attitude since Texas and Oklahoma left. Um, it's just been a formality to them. It's just a matter of how and when it will happen. And some, I don't know whether you want me to call them journalists. Um, there is a guy on Twitter who's always uh, tweeting scoops in his words about realignment. I mean, basically, he's just he's he's parroting what's being told to him from the Kansas side of things, which was basically reflected. I mean, I'll say it, like he definitely has the Kansas spin on things because it's been reflected by what Travis Goff, the AD there, now said publicly. But it's always been we have 
look, we're, the Big Ten is interested. We need to get our football stadium in order. We need to make sure we have the money for the exit fee. Uh, we're going to fundraise, 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 make sure we have the money for the exit fee, and like we'll we'll get there eventually. Kansas basketball, too big to fail. And so like that's been the general attitude of Kansas fans through this whole process. And Travis Goff, I had not seen any public comments from him until Friday when he spoke before Kansas's uh, game at Coastal Carolina. And um, so he has to appease a fan base that's like bloodthirsty for Big Ten money, Big Ten prestige, and if not that, then the ACC. So – here are some of the comments I'm reading. It was Jesse Newell who put out this article and some tweets. And and I have to admit, he, when I read the article, it didn't come across quite – it came across in a bit different tone-wise, a bit different tone-wise to me than than just seeing the tweets did. But he's got to appease these fans who, like, want him to be going out and, and pursuing the Big Ten actively and trying to get there as hard as he can because he's a new athletic director. He's a pretty much brand-new – AD here. He's been on the job for what, like three or four months? How, how long ago was it that Jeff Long uh, flamed out in a blaze of befitting glory? Not that long. So Kansas, the, the lead of the story is Kansas Athletic Director Travis Goff said Friday was clearly a good day for the Big 12 in announcing four new, remember, four new members, but remained non-committal when it came to KU's potentially pursuing other leagues in the future. Um, so Goff was asked whether Friday's Big 12 news potentially stops other conversations while pursuing what's best for KU. Quote, no. The beauty of it is when you think about being focused on what's best for Kansas, that applies to anything we do. It applies to conference affiliation. It applies to what we're trying to achieve in our programs. It applies to the financial strength. It applies to the fans and alumni engagement. So uh, basically the answer is in the first word and the rest of it is uh, a lot of fluff. Uh, no. The announcement on Friday does not stop Kansas from pursuing um, – other conferences. He also ended with here, quote, and so regardless of all those dynamics, we stay centered and I believe more focused on what's best for KU. What's best for KU should be what drives us forward in whatever environment it is. Goff went on to speak about the importance of KU improving its stock in football before circling back to the talk about the athletic department's future. What's best for Kansas doesn't change regardless of conference discussion or speculation. It's still what's best for KU and it still puts us in the most positive strength and position we can be in the league we're in most importantly and for all the unknowns out there. And then he also went on to, and this was the one that finally drew a reaction from me on Twitter. And to be honest, like I, I should have just avoided it. I, I try not to slip into total Homer guy mode too much um, and, and go too over the top. Like if I'm going to take a shot, I want it to, I want to come correct. I want it to be a legitimate shot that needs to be out there. But he was talking about the, the finances and says, um, okay, I've got the wrong quote pulled up here right now. But he he did say that, now this is one that will make you laugh. He said, I'm biased, but I think KU has as much potential as any other Power 5 athletics program in the country, so that's where we're focused. I mean, look, that's the thing that you're going to have to say if you're the AD at the school. But he says, we're financially less secure now than we were eight weeks ago and maybe significantly financially less secure. The facts are there's more likely a scenario where when we do a new deal with a makeup where when we do a new deal with a makeup where we likely can't stay at the level we're at, I don't, the quote's kind of all over the place. Basically what he's saying is the league doesn't have as much value. We're going to take a financial haircut and uh, that sucks. And that's why we're going to still look around that. That's what you're getting from Travis Goff in Kansas right now. Um, again, like all of this conversation, all of this stuff, like I understand why Goff is saying that. And he's a new young athletic director in a position where his, his fan base is, is pretty entitled to thinking that they belong in a place like the big 10. So he has to say those kinds of things, but it is, it's, it, you know, they're the one institution that has publicly really come out and kind of thumb their nose at, at what the new big 12 is. I understand that he also said, Hey, it is a good day for the big 12, but you're, you're basically going against the spirit of the day with those comments. So I can understand why the rest of the league would look around at it and be like, all right, come on, like really dudes, and I think that's that's kind of the reaction I have and just w what I think the appropriate reaction to that should be. Like, really, who are you? Who, you know, the the one school that's that's publicly on the, you know, in the aftermath, it, it was the day, on the day that the Big 12 adds four new schools, the one school that is publicly compa complaining about the financial position that the league is in is the school that has been a, a complete albatross when it comes to football, which is what drives conference realignment and drives the strength of the league. So it's kind of one of those like know your role, know your place, um, know your place. You guys have been not just the worst 
not just the worst Big 12 football program, you've been the worst Power 5 football program and have gone through, frankly, one of the worst decade-long stretches in the history of college football. So, like, who are you to be the ones complaining about this new league? Um, that's that's the general sentiment and attitude that I have toward it. It's very annoying. Obviously, I am admittedly more annoyed by it because of the rivalry that's there. Um, there's always going to be a level of annoyance between K-State and Kansas because of that. Um so it probably digs at me more than it would others, but I would think around the league this is going to this is going to get annoying and it's it's going to to wear thin. So yeah, UCF fans, well, I, I I'm laughing nighttime seeing you chime in there because I've seen other UCF fans in the chat here today. Like oh like oh it's Kansas. Yes, it's Kansas. Um, it is Kansas. Welcome to your new uh, conference brethren here. I can give you a little cheat sheet on what it is that you need to know. Um, about Kansas fans and and Goop three twenty one makes a good point here. Sounds like they're afraid of the new competition, even in basketball. That's one thing that cracked me up too. Is like, look, you guys are all about hoops, right? I mean, Bill Self just got a, a better basketball league. Bill Self just got a better hoops league. Maybe he's a little scared there. Maybe he's also a little scared about what may be coming from the um, the NCAA double secret, triple new, uh, top secret investigative committee that's going to. I don't know, do whatever it is that they're going to do to Kansas. I'm making light of the fact that it's it's not that same infractions committee that's doing it anymore, right? Um, th- there's a lot going on at Kansas. There are a lot of moving parts and dynamics there. I, I will give Travis Goff credit. On the football field, it, it sure looks like he has at least a, a competent coach, which I think everybody thought anyway in Lance Leipold, but um, in just catching a little bit of the game on Friday and seeing what the reaction has been to it, I thought it was best summed up by – Sam Ellinger, one of the Kansas City Star columnists, saying, like, Kansas looks like a regular bad team that, you know, actually practices and stuff, as opposed to whatever it was that they were under Les Miles, which I I think is I think is true. Um, I think that's fair. So they're they're taking steps. I mean, they are doing some things to try and better position themselves, but it's like how how far do you have to go when getting a pat on the back means still not covering a 26 point spread taking on a Sunbelt team? Um that's not a great position that your football is in. And again, brings us back full circle to where this conversation all starts. The genesis of it is you are by far the worst program in the only thing that drives the importance of a league's uh, viability in 2021. And you're the one complaining the most about what's happening with the league right now. So that that's kind of the state of where things are at. I have not seen much in the way of public dissent from anybody else. You could tell that there were schools that were, just in the way that they were acting on social media, like more excited, more into what had happened with the expansion. And, uh, you know, like Kansas, Oklahoma State, I don't think they were really going to be the schools that were there. But Kansas, of course, has been the one to to speak out. So UCF fans, yes, you'll learn very quickly. Uh, Kansas fans are very uh, – they think very highly of themselves because of this basketball program that they, that they do have. Um, you know what, Modest Cowboy E, and by the way, I should have said this off off the top from the rip, but I didn't. If you want to, uh, if you want to donate and get your comment, your question or comment up to the top, make sure that I see it. I'll try to get to as much as I can in just a regular uh, chat box. But if you want to donate and get your comment up to the top, you just click the dollar sign uh, below the chat box to donate there. Or if you just want to support what I do, you can certainly do that as well. Um, okay, here's a addicted to capping. Addicted to capping. I like this. I've been a Jayhawk fan all my life. We don't belong in the Big Ten or ACC. Just shut up. Man, put in the work, earn your place in the conference, Goff. I think Leipold can do good for KU. I do – look, I think I think Leipold, like I said, I, uh, every indication has been that he is a, a competent, legitimate football coach. It's the kind of hire that Kansas should have made a decade ago instead of trolling around with Charlie Weiss and Les Miles. But that – you know, everything that you need to know, if if I'm trying to educate you on kind of like where Kansas fans are at, every everything you need to know about how Kansas conducts itself is – just go look through their football hires. Um, the only school with the arrogance to hire Charlie Weiss and then Les Miles in 2018, like 2018 version of Les Miles is Kansas. Like, hey, we're Kansas. We can go get a big name and it'll, it'll be fine. It'll fix everything instead of just substance, you know, style over substance. Clearly, they haven't figured out with basketball. I can't I can't say anything about that. And I will reiterate again. I think there's a lot of earned arrogance there to what what they've done with um, with basketball. But it, it is permeated to everything else. And the analogy that I keep using is I think like Kansas fans have this arrogance about basketball where they think that the um, the money that they have, like the value of the dollar, 
is just as powerful in Europe as it is here when actually the, uh, what do you call it? Like the way, God, I'm going to sound like an idiot here. The uh, exchange rate on that is not very good when you're translating basketball currency to conference realignment currency. The value of the dollar has changed now. So it's not, you're not getting the same bang for your buck that you are in the basketball world where you won the league 15 years in a row. So that there's there's the cognitive dissonance really that's that's going on uh, between reality and I think where Kansas fans think reality is at. Now I like whoever it was. I'm sorry I missed. I got a little distracted there. Whoever it was that brought up Texas, who brought up Texas? That's the other thing we have to cover here. Let's let's all get into this. Did everybody watch the Texas Longhorns? I'm sure I'm sure most of you here in the chat. I'm sure most of you here in the chat watch more of Texas than I did because K-State was playing at the same time, so I was covering the K-State game. And um, so I, I really have not seen, like, any of the Texas game. I really haven't. But what a wondrous score that was. What a wondrous score that was. I mean, and I look, I'll be honest, I was pretty bought in on Texas after watching them week one because I have a ton of respect for Louisiana. I thought that was a really nice win that they had in week one. And then it just all falls apart, you know, to a middling at best SEC football program. Like that was just, that was Texas to a T. Was it not like you go to Texas leaves to go to the SEC, arrogant, arrogant as can be on their way out. And then goes to take on a, not only a new SEC team, right? Not, not only a, a team from their new league, but a team that was, uh, back in the old Southwest conference days with them, a conference that they effectively ruined. Right. And then they, they take on one of the worst programs over the last five to 10 years in the sec and get absolutely smacked, just absolutely smacked. It was perfect. And then we've got, man, I wish you guys could go look at Emmanuel Acho's tweet. Emmanuel Acho, former Texas linebacker who's now working for ESPN. This, this guy's had some real gems uh, on Twitter over the last six months or so. But actually, really more like six weeks. A lot of this started about six weeks ago. But he said, look, Texas is Texas was not leaving for the SEC to uh, win more games. They were leaving for more money. Like, so just – and it's like, okay, well, so the Texas stance on getting absolutely blasted, absolutely blistered by Arkansas is that, well, look, we were just leaving for the money anyway. We're not really trying to win games. It's like, okay, so so te- the, the comeback from Texas is just – embracing that we are literally the embodiment of the trust fund baby that has no concept of how to, you know, have social skills or live a real fulfilling life. They just live off of daddy's money for the rest of their days and have a yacht for no reason. And all they know is that the money makes other people jealous. And so they can flaunt the money and do everything in the name of money while adding nothing of real substantive value to the world. Let's just embrace that. Let's just embrace that because we are Texas. Um, congratulations, Texas, on that. Um, man, I mean, nighttime, I see you in there taking some shots. That's very good. That's a that's a great way to ingratiate yourself to the uh, lovely folks of the rest of the Big 12 here. But let me just ask this question. Like, what, what do we think would happen if UCF, if UCF were playing Texas every year over the last 10 years in the, in the Big 12? I mean, forget that. We'll, we'll stretch it to uh, 2010, right? Because it was 2009 when they played – in the uh, BCS national championship game against Alabama. If UCF had played Texas every single year for the last 12 years, what would the record be? What would the series record be between UCF and Texas over the last 12 years? I, I would be fascinated to know that. And I'm thinking nine, nine, three, nine, nine, nine wins for UCF three for Texas, something like that. Um, I mean, I just, I, I hope, UCF, let me just say this to you guys. I hope you get your shot. I hope we have the the two-year overlap or at least one year of overlap between all of this. And I I hope you guys get your shot at Texas because it it is fun. There is not much that is more satisfying than than beating Texas because of the arrogance that emanates out of Austin. So um, I hope you guys get your shot. (laughs) That's that's what I will say about that. I appreciate all of you guys that are in the chat right now. Uh, keep the questions and comments coming. If you want to uh, donate, you can click the dollar sign below the chat box. That'll make sure that your uh, question or comment gets up to the top and, and gets my attention as well. Probably going to give you about another uh, 20, 25 minutes here in the live chat. So I have not really broken down much of what happened other than I saw I saw B. John Robinson's stat line in that game, and I am, I am rather shocked that um, – 
Bijan Robinson was held in check the way that he was because again, like the, the dude has otherworldly talent um, and was, was incredible in week one. And, and clearly Sark was trying to get him the ball. So I just, that part to me is um, that part to me is pretty shocking that that, that happened to Texas and he got shut down the way that he did. You know, another thing I saw that was really, I thought apropos about Texas was um, who was that? It was one, it was Tyler McComas. I think he was a radio guy in Norman and he said, look, th- this is what Texas is, a week-to-week program that can't ever handle any level of success or prosperity. And it, 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 did, feel like, it did feel like there was something to that. Um, it did feel like there was something to that, that Texas got, got a big head. Like, I, you know, everybody – because, look, the thing with Texas is, like, they have so many people wanting to anoint them back, and that, that really has taken on a life of its own, the Texas is back thing, not just from a positive standpoint, but even from a negative standpoint. Like, everybody just wants to play into that one way or the other. So I think that is kind of – it just hurts Texas at this point, and it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that it's always going to fall back. The pendulum is always going to swing back to the other side and, um, you know, w- wind up becoming something that turns into a meme here, be- and, and, it, and it hurts – that Texas can't just kind of go about its business like a, a normal school. I think a, a part of it is like there's so much attention drawn to Texas by this point, and they have turned into a a literal college football meme over the last decade with the lack of success that they've had relative to the resources that they have, and everybody enjoys dunking on them so much, and the attitude that the fans have doesn't help. And um, I just think a lot of that combined with like the Longhorn Network and extra media commitments that the coach had, I think all that stuff really does genuinely hurt Texas and they can't, it's kind of like living like a celebrity. You can't live a totally normal life if you are a celebrity. If you are, uh, you guys will roll your eyes at this, like Kanye West, man, that's that's my dude. If you're Kanye West, you can't just roll out and go to the grocery store. You have to live your life differently and there are different pressures and things that make it more difficult like that. I, I think Texas genuinely lives that right now and that's going to make, everything tougher for them moving forward to actually put together a consistent winning program. And like, you know, I see you Rick's Bevo in here. And first of all, thank you for being in the chat. Even as I'm here uh, taking a, a playful blowtorch to uh, Texas says, I'm going to LMAO when we spank K state by 30, just an off night. Well, you may well spank K state by 30. If Skylar Thompson is really out for the rest of the year, because Will Howard does not look like he is ready right now to, to be the quarterback, which was the same story last year so you may well and you did last year fair point texas put up 69 on a depleted uh covid and transfer depleted k-state defense at the end of the year that was playing linebackers at safety uh out of necessity you absolutely did tom herman put the it just beat the brakes off k-state last year but i don't know man to say just an off night i mean like dude ricks like what what has arkansas been over the last five to ten years I mean, Arkansas has been, I don't even think it's fair to call them middling. Arkansas has been a bad program, an ostensibly bad program in the SEC, and they smoked you. They, he, Rice, Rice gave Arkansas a better game. Rice gave Arkansas a better game in week one. Like Arkansas was struggling with Rice in the first half. Just an off night. I don't, the last 10 years, Ricks, indicate that you are a seven and five program. We really shouldn't be surprised by a seven and five program going on the road at even a bad SEC a school and and getting the break speed off of them. I don't think there's much leg to stand on to say just an off night if we're just if we're being realistic here. And and the standard for Texas should be not Kansas State. The standard for Texas should be Alabama and Georgia. That's why you're joining the SEC, right? And the resources match up there. So look, man, I, I don't mean to to dig the twist the knife too hard, but if we're talking about Texas standards here, it should not be K State. And Texas standards should what Texas has been, what, what the reality of what Texas is right now, that fits. That was not uh, that was not a that was not Alabama going to Ole Miss. You know, like Alabama had the, was it back to back years where they lost to Ole Miss. Alabama goes to Ole Miss and loses a game, and we say, well, I mean, clearly, like, look, it's an it's an off night. Um, this is not that. This is pretty much what Texas has been. That that really should like nobody was really surprised. I, I guess I, I will say I was a bit surprised because they looked so good in Week One. But in general, you know, if we're not going to use just a one week sample size, nobody was surprised that Texas got absolutely smoked by by Arkansas. So, you know, I, I guess whatever, whatever helps you sleep at night and maybe Sark is the guy and maybe maybe that winds up. Uh, hey, uh, we'll we'll see. But, you know, I chuckle because I just I have so much data to back up 
really what Texas has been over the last 10 years that I'm, I'm not, I'm not here for that. I just, I can't buy that. So uh, let's see, Te Texas boy. I see you in the chat there. Are you a Texas fan? We have Arkansas ran the ball at will on Texas. Yeah. Now. I, okay. So nighttime. Thank you for that. I looking at the box score. That was another thing that stood out to me and I, I shouldn't be surprised. Like Sam Pittman wants to run the ball. Uh, but I was like, golly, I mean, they, <laughs> I think what the quarterback threw for maybe a buck 50 for Arkansas. I mean, Texas just couldn't stop the run at all. Um, and, and that also plays to a T with like what Texas is soft, soft. I mean, Texas has been soft They're a, It's a country club football program. Great amenities, a lot to like you come in, you can live the lifestyle in Austin. I'll never forget the last time I was in Austin, I went into a bar and people were doing uh, they were shotgunning Red Bull vodkas. Um, hey man, like keep Austin weird. It's a weird place. And that's in a, in a good fun way. But, um, you can live that life, but you're not, you're going to, I mean, that, that does not make you a tough football team. Like there's just so much working against Texas, I think, in creating an actual tough football team. And, uh, I, uh, yeah, good luck in the sec. Uh, good luck in the sec. Uh, BYU, I see, I see Kevin saying BYU has to handle Texas at Oklahoma well recently. Uh, BYU, I know you guys have plenty of experience in spanking Texas and congratulations to BYU for winning the Holy War. Um, that's a, that's a heck of a win. It was cool to see the reaction. Uh, everybody rushing the field there. I know it had been what, nine years. Um, it had been nine years since, since BYU had beaten Utah. So that's a great feeling, and it came literally a day after you guys joined the Big 12, which clearly BYU was fired up about, and this is all coming on the heels of an 11-win season last year where you have Zach Wilson now playing in the NFL today. And I, the Jets lost, right? I don't think that really went super well. Or, uh, uh, Yeah, they, they lost, right? Do I have that right? They lost. But either way, you get the point. Things are going well in, uh, in BYU land right now. So I was happy to see that. I was happy to see that. The, uh, the rest of the league – are the four new schools that are coming in really held their own this weekend. Big wins for everybody pretty much. And um, <laughs> I'm laughing at Rick's comment. Um, everybody else, the new schools in the league, held up their end of the bargain this weekend. So that was that was good to see. And genuinely, it is cool to see how excited BYU is to join the Big 12. And it, it seems like everybody is. Um, but a lot of passion out there seemingly from BYU and UCF fans um, about uh, – about coming into the league. So I did want to make sure and get a, get a shout out in there. I, I watched a little bit. I saw just a little bit of the BYU game when I was kind of wrapping up work at around like uh 10 30, 11 o'clock um, last night. Let me say this. I'm going to, I'll try and rapid fire some questions here. And if you want your question to get to the top, you can donate um, by clicking the dollar sign below the uh, chat box. As I see, I did just get a, a couple of those right there. One more point that I want to make, and this centers around, my school, K-State, but also this narrative about the Big 12 and competing with the ACC and the Pac-12. Did we all see what happened to USC? Now, Oregon had a great win. I'm not going to take anything at all away from Oregon. Nothing at all. Uh, that's a it's an incredible win. The Pac-12 needed that win because you look at what happened to USC. Um, UCLA, I guess, would be the only other team trying to carry any sort of flag, but I, I feel like their, their playoff chances would be essentially null and void. Uh, if that win had not happened for Oregon, and it was a great, great win. But, man, I watched – look, Stanford almost got shut out by K-State in week one, and it would have been the first time that has happened since 2006. They looked completely inept. They looked like they had absolutely no shot at doing anything offensively at all, at all. And they gave up – look, Stanford – or Stanford, rather, after that performance almost getting shut out. They put 42 on USC and we're leading 42 to 13 in the second half at the Coliseum. Like, what is that? And the attendance, man, if you want some uh, attendance shaming porn, there's definitely a lot of that out there from, uh, from the crowd at the Coliseum that USC had not good attendance, not a good game. You had Matt Leiner popping off on Twitter uh, saying, this is not how it was back in the day in reference to said attendance. So, um, not good. It does make me feel better as a K-State fan, and, and frankly, it just makes me feel better about the league. Yes, does it also reinforce the fact that college football is just a crazy sport, and that's why we love it? Absolutely. Yes, it does. Um, it, it does. And there's there's an element of that kind of in the same vein of baseball, where, you know, like baseball can be a crazy game. Obviously, college football is not quite like that, but um, there's an element of that to just college football week to week and, you know, working with um, just 18 to 22 year old kids and the volatility of some of that. But 
man, that was brutal. And uh, the Pac-12 still has some problems. Washington looked horrendous once again this week. That's another one of your typical flag-bearing teams in the league. So it just, you know, to me, all of it, I, I was looking through the top 25 today. And you, you'd have to go look at my Twitter to get the specifics of it. But it was like, you know, the, the new Big 12, quote-unquote, as three teams ranked, it was pretty much the same as the Pac-12. It was pretty much the same as what the ACC is right now because you have Cincinnati holding their spot up in the top 10 right now along with the uh, the, the Oregon and uh, Clemson's of the world in those other two leagues, right? So it actually does still look pretty similar. And then TCU and UCF are like the first two teams outside of the top 25 in the AP poll anyway. Uh, so you have a couple that are just knocking on the door right there too. Um so I, it just – everything continues to reinforce to me again. Like, look, the Big 12, small sample size. Again, I don't want to judge anything too much off of two weeks. And Oregon winning is huge for the Pac-12 and all of that. But we just – you know, we get more and more evidence that it's – the Big 12 will be competitive with the other two leagues. And the, the SEC and the Big 10 are probably going to pull away. I mean, like that – I think that's really the point and how we should be framing some of this discussion. And unfortunately, I feel like the, the discussion nationally is just going to turn into – it's the four power leagues and then everybody else. When in reality, what it should be is you have two legitimate power leagues in the SEC and the Big Ten because their finances are running away from everybody so much. The brands concentrated at the top are running away from everybody so much. They have such a high concentrate of the brands that actually rate on TV, which there's really only like 10 to 15 and everybody else is about the same. And then you're going to have the ACC – the Pac-12 and the Big 12 and like next in line. But I think that gap between the two and the three is going to grow bigger and bigger. And that's the way that it really should be framed as opposed to four, one, everybody else, which unfortunately is, I, I fear, how it's going to be viewed unless the Big 12 can really start to make a name for itself on the national scene with some of these schools uh, really winning big once the league starts. But the the interesting part, the the fascinating part about that, and E Dog, I, I see your donation and your question. Appreciate it a ton. I, I will get to that. I will get to that here in just a second. Um, but the the really truly fascinating part about what's going to happen next is all of these schools. You know, we talk about money and resources. All of these schools in the Big Twelve are going to be pretty much the exact same as far as resources go, right? Like, there's not going to be the gap of a Texas and Oklahoma that that currently exists in the league where they have financially so much more than everybody else in the conference. And you have the Longhorn Network bringing in extra revenue. Oklahoma makes a nice chunk of money um, from their third tier TV, their Sooner TV um, that they have going now too. You're, you're just, you're not going to have those same sorts of things in the new big 12. So that'll make it, uh, that could be good. That could be bad. Maybe it produces enough parity. Everybody beats each other up that you don't have a power really emerge up at the top. I don't know, but that to me is, is the real intriguing part of this. You just have a lot of equals. We talked about this, I think in the last live chat where someone was like, Hey, who is going to be the the power of this new league? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know that anybody really knows. It's it's too tough to say because everybody is so, so damn even right now. So anyway, I think that's an interesting point. And I hope that, you know, I'm certainly going to fight for the discussion to be framed as two power leagues and everybody else. Okay, so E-Dog asked me a K-State specific question here, but it does. I think if you're a Big 12 fan, this does definitely matter to what's going to happen in the league the rest of the year. K-State's just outside the top 25 uh, with Skylar Thompson. They're clearly, right now, they look like a borderline top 25 team. Skylar Thompson, their quarterback, went down with a with a knee injury. And um, it was very unfortunate to see. It was a non-contact injury. Um, I'm trying to think, like, yeah, the, to answer your question, yes, I, I have heard some things on it today. I'm trying to filter through my head how careful I should be about what I say. What, what I feel like I can tell you for sure is that there is there is some cautious optimism that it will not be a season-ending injury. Um, I, I do feel fine in saying that. There is some cautious optimism that Skylar Thompson's injury will not be a season-ending injury. Now, I will also tell you that last year when we went through this exact same thing almost at the exact same time, uh, the initial reports like at about this time last year after the Texas Tech game where Thompson got hurt when Rico Jeffers hit him, um, there, the initial report was like, oh, that actually came back not as bad as we thought, and it may just be a short-term injury. And then they like went in for some further tests and diagnosis, and within a day or two, that had changed to, okay, yeah, this is going to be season-ending. So even if there is some cautious optimism right now, I don't want to get your hopes up too much and then have something change and have it actually wind up being bad enough that it is season-ending. So I, I really doubt that we get any official word for a while because last year – Chris Kleiman played it pretty coy, 
even after I think behind the scenes we knew that it was pretty much done and wrapped up that it would be a season ending injury. Um, just you know, whenever you see the non contact, it your heart drops, and the reaction of the reaction of Thompson. Uh, after it happened, he put his hands up over his head. If you want to see the reaction on my Twitter account, really, it is pretty powerful. Even if you're not a K-State fan, kind of captures the essence of how cruel a game football can be. Um, because here you have this guy that just spent September through May rehabbing from a season-ending injury last year. He's 24 years old, coming back for a sixth year. I think that was a tough decision, whether or not he actually wanted to come back um, and did and goes through all of it and gets into week two. And, and the play that he gets hurt on, Deuce Vaughn is running to the outside, and Skyler was trying to run and basically throw a lead block. I mean, he's just trying to, you know, put in a ton of effort to help his teammate and winds up with this non-contact injury and is writhing in pain on the ground. And so he puts his hands up over his helmet, and Chris Kleiman actually came out and was crying next to him um, because there's a lot of love between those two guys, and he fully understands the story and, and the depth behind everything that's going on there. And I, I think when you see that reaction, everybody was like, okay, well, this, this probably that's probably it. Right. I mean, that has to be it. But climate said after the game, and I can understand how this would happen, that it was just, you know, seeing him there and the fact that they were working on his knee and you could tell it was non-contact without knowing anything specific about the injury. You could see how you would just break down in tears because you're just scared and fearing the worst. And that was really his play after the game. Like, we really don't know. It was kind of us both just fearing the worst at that moment in time, which is completely understandable. So long story short. I would say there is some cautious optimism. It is not season ending. I do not believe that it's an ACL. I do not believe it's an Achilles, which were two of the um, popular theories um, after the game. And just in watching that, um, certainly my first reaction, just seeing it was like, oh man, that might be Achilles. I do not believe it's Achilles. I do not believe it's ACL. There is some cautious optimism that it won't end his season. Uh, definitely would not expect him to play this week against Nevada, and Vegas certainly isn't because K-State's a two-point underdog right now in, in Vegas at home to Nevada, a team that's directly behind them. They're 33-34 and 34 right now in the AP poll, so it's going to be an intriguing matchup next week. But that's basically what I can give you on Skyler Thompson's injury right now. Um, so I appreciate it, E-Dog. Thank you for uh, the donation and the support, and uh, I hope that gave you – you know, as much of an answer as, as I really can right now. And to be honest, I mean, that is basically all that I know. Um, basically, the only thing I'm not giving you is what I've been told, like the specific issue is that they're worried about and or looking at it. I, I don't really feel comfortable doing that, but um, I'll just say, like, I'll, I'll give a shout out to my buddies at K-State Online. If you want to get the full scoop on that, I would definitely check out K-State Online if you're not a subscriber there because um, they're they're doing a really good job handling that right now. Uh, so J and J Outlaw Sports, and again, if you want to, uh, if you want to get your comment up to the top, shoot, it's eight oh seven already, man. I'm having fun today, and I hate that I have to cut this off a little bit earlier than I normally do, but I'm gonna have to bounce at about eight fifteen. Uh, so I've got about eight more minutes. If you want to make sure your question or comment gets in, um, you can donate by clicking the dollar sign under the say something box under the chat box, and uh, I will try to get to it here before I do head out. So J and J Outlaw Sports, what's going to happen is the pack is going to let the Big Ten lead them into oblivion over a weak alliance, and then USC, Oregon, Washington, et cetera, will leave. Very, very much, I think you're pretty accurate in what you're saying. At least, I think that's a very real possibility, put it that way. I think that's a very, very real possibility that that is what happens. Um, because right now, I mean, it's just so easy for everybody to say the right things about trust and gentlemen's agreement, and we don't need to sign anything, and, um, you know, kumbaya right now, when they all have a common enemy, which is the SEC. And the Big Ten, I'm not even saying that the Big Ten behind closed doors right now is sitting here thinking, hey, we've got this diabolical plan that we're going to lead them into an alliance. I just think right now it's like, hey, we have an immediate problem that we need to address, and that is the SEC. Because we saw the SEC getting more powerful. We see where this road is leading. We see that NCAA governance is likely going to change. Um, we see that the NCAA may cease to exist, and that Greg Sankey could be the guy that winds up being our overlord here pretty quick if we don't do something. So the initial reaction is like, hey, no, of course, we're not going to poach you because we need to band together as much as we can right now um, with as many like-minded people and individuals as we have out there and just like make sure that we we shut this down as much as we can, then figure out the rest later. I mean, it's kind of like how Bob Bowlesby and, and Gene Taylor, like a, a lot of the people that um, have spoken on the topic of what's going on in the Big 12 right now. It was like, we don't have divisions figured out right now because the idea was we need to just go expand, get the schools in, do everything we can on that front, and then 
figure out the details later. We need to take care of the big picture first. And I think that's really what's happening here. If you're thinking from Kevin Warren and the big tens perspective, we need to go big picture first, make sure we stop the sec, then kind of get our bearings and see what happens. And if the PAC 12 continues to have their problems, if the next TV negotiation doesn't go very well, which is going to be coming here in the next 18 months or so very well could happen that those schools wind up leaving. And man, are there some parallels between USC and Texas? Now USC has been more successful than Texas, certainly over the last decade, but um, USC also underperforming, you know, I mean, we're sitting here talking about the PAC 12 being really like the future of their league really hinges on USC and its happiness. And yet USC is going out there and getting curb stomped by Stanford, you know, who could barely muster uh, an offensive touchdown in week one. So there, there are complex problems in the PAC 12 too, just like there have been in the big 12 as it relates to, to their biggest brand in, uh, in USC. So um, I, I appreciate that thought, j and I, I think you're you're pretty spot on there. Um, again, I've got just a few more minutes here. If you want to uh, really like five more minutes here, if you want to get your uh, question or comment in, you can donate by clicking the dollar sign below the chat box there. I see Michael, I think this is old here. I'm not caught up in the chat, but I see your question here about West Virginia. Uh, John, you don't see any fire about West Virginia going to the ACC, do you? Really feel that was a careful what you asked for situation. Big 12 is better with West Virginia and West Virginia with them. Uh, I definitely agree that the Big 12 is better with West Virginia. I do not want to lose West Virginia. Um, and I, 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 think, I think West Virginia is better off in the, the Big 12. I mean, the, the hard part about this, right, always comes down to the money. And it's just it's impossible to know right now what the money is going to be in the new look Big 12. We just don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm, that's not even me doubting like the Sikkim 365 report that it was only going to be like a five or six million dollar per year loss based on what the old Big 12 was. It's just you can you can be told that right now by somebody who may have totally the right idea. And then when you actually sit down at the table to negotiate, the dynamics could have changed a bunch by the time that actually happens. So it's just really hard to know that. And that's that's where I just it's hard to make these statements definitively like, oh, things will undoubtedly be better in the Big 12 for school X or school Y because we money does matter a lot. And it's there's just going to be a lot of variance on how we all feel about the Big 12 based on on how that winds up breaking down. So, um, yeah, Dale Donuts asks, what is Oliver Luck doing behind the scenes? I don't know, man. I need I need some of you uh, West Virginia folks to help me out with that. Uh, I need you to um, to tell me what, what's going on with Oliver Luck, because I, I don't know. I haven't heard I haven't heard like word one uh, since Oliver Luck was initially added. And like what I was told at that time is like the Big 12 had been looking for somebody to serve that kind of a role and that they kicked the tires on um, uh, Jim Delaney it was the former big 10 commissioner that they had looked at him as a consultant and it, it for whatever reason, wound up being Oliver luck. Um, so I, I really don't know. I don't know what's going on with, uh, with good old Oliver there. Uh, John is ESPN intentionally not covering big 12 expansion over the weekend. I, I did have, um, I did have somebody point out to me. I think it was my producer on my radio show. He was like, look, man, on Friday, he's like, dude, they don't even have like big 12 expansion on the front page of the, uh, on the front page of ESPN.com. And I was like, well, yeah. I mean, look, not surprising. I don't know that that's, I, I'm very, I, I don't even think it's fair to say conspiratorial, but I very much buy into the theory that ES, that there was foul play afoot when ESPN was going with the AAC and their whole plan to try and get out of the contract with the big 12 and blow the league up. I, I fully believe that. I don't know that them not covering big 12 expansion as much, at least in, in generalities, like on ESPN.com and stuff is because they're, totally trying to get after the big 12. I think it's just much more like it's a, it's a rough time of year to be competing from a news cycle standpoint, because on Friday, everybody's high off of the uh, Cowboys um, Buccaneers game. That was just a tremendous game. It was the opening night of the NFL season. You have the opening weekend um, coming up the NFL as well. So you're just competing against a lot, right? And the actual college football season starting, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just a lot going on. There's a lot to compete with, but it does kind of get back to, uh, the the general idea that people just don't seem to care much about flyover country in the Midwest and you're not going to get – like if it were the ACC, if it were the Big Ten that had expanded, yes, there would definitely be more coverage about it. I think what's, what's, what's killing me is like – this is back-to-back weeks now that I've heard about Andre Ware, who's going on ESPN. Um, uh, Houston fans, man, you, gotta, you guys got to come get your boy. You got to come get your boy because Andre Ware was out there – right after the news had broken two weeks ago that Houston was likely going to be coming to the Big 12, saying, like, ah, oh, Houston would be better off waiting for the Pac-12. They should just do that. 
And then this week it was, God, what was it? Now I'm going to space out on what it was, but someone sent me the audio of Andre Ware just kind of, uh, I think it was him talking about just talking down on the Big 12 in general and what kind of a payout they could wind up getting TV revenue wise. And I'm just like, what? Where does Andre Ware get off thinking that he has the ability to talk down on the league and what's going on here? Like, come on, man. Uh, I see Kevin talking about Mike Oresco and Oresco comment there. Um, Mike Oresco did say he's likely to work with the AAC teams on getting out. That's something I'll have a video coming up on, uh, coming up this week for you on. Um, so we'll definitely talk some more about that. I would get into it more here, but I, I really do have to go. I got to be somewhere at eight 30. Um, so I'm going to have to pop off here. This has been really fun and we have a great audience tonight. Like the numbers are huge. I think this is the, um, I think this is the biggest audience that we've had on one of these so far. So much appreciated. All of you guys that have hung out here, you guys that did donate, um, appreciate it a ton. Um, oh, okay. Jeffrey, you got in here right under the gun. Thanks for the donation. Uh, John, what do you think about maybe adding Boise and Utah state? Um, Boise, I do think like there's been a lot of reporting. I think Boise is, is if not number one at the top of the list, definitely in the top two, it would be next on the list for the big 12. Um, if, and when that time comes Utah state's one, I have not heard, um, mentioned much. I think like it boy, typically you see Memphis with Boise and then typically like San Diego state is another one that comes in there. And I've, I've had a lot of education on San Diego state here recently, um, in particular, because I did a radio hit with, uh, with some of them. So anyway, that's what I got. I do have to run. I really, really do, but appreciate you guys a ton. I'll be back with some more content this week. Um, if you guys have, if you guys have thoughts on like what you want to see content wise and stuff, I'm certainly open to uh, suggestions. You can, um, Oh, Cyclone Steve, man. I'm sorry. So Cyclone Steve, here's the thing. If you, if you donate less than $5, it doesn't pop up to the top of my chat thing. It just like goes in the normal chat. And so if I'm not on it, like if I'm not looking directly at it, when it happens, it can get buried. So shout out Cyclone Steve. Thank you for the $2 donation. I still appreciate you guys. It's just harder for me to see. Uh, and I probably should have told you guys that, that like the, the $5 donations, actually stick at the top. If it's $2, it just scrolls like a normal chat thing. So it's easy for me to miss. So uh, not ungrateful for that at all. Not ungrateful for that at all. And I know it was a tough weekend uh, for the clones. We didn't even get to Iowa State. So I, I know. I'm sorry about that, Cyclone Steve. Um, okay. All right, guys, I will talk to you soon. If you have ideas, questions, or comments, whatever, hit me up on Twitter, at J.L. Kurtz, and my DMs. That's the easiest way to get to me. Um, shout out to all you guys for being awesome. Shout out to Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. And uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday night.